Hi, we're here today with Meredith and David Lieben, who are helping us to get smarter about literacy and the Common Core. We're going to start right now talking about Core Knowledge, which is a curriculum that is available for free for grades P through 2 on Engage New York. And part of what we want to get smarter about is why is it there and why is it good? So Meredith and David were part of the team that helped make that possible. And I'd love to hear them talk a little bit about why core knowledge? You taught us earlier, David, about vocabulary, knowledge, and fluency. I'm assuming these things are a big part of the reason why the two of you worked as hard as you did um, supporting this partnership with core knowledge. One of the things that we love about core knowledge is that it enables all children to have knowledge because it deliberately engages them with building knowledge. So there's not a question of activating something that's there from some other source. So it builds knowledge even in the materials it uses to teach reading in the skills strand, but deliberately does that in the read aloud strand, which is listening and learning, which is delivered to children before they can read for themselves the rich world of knowledge so that students do have a trove of background knowledge to draw on. So that's one of the things I really value about core knowledge is it does that directly and deliberately and teaches children to find the joy in that. You're talking about the building of knowledge and core knowledge, but how, how does that happen? How does that play out? And I know one of the ways that that works, one of the ways it's structured is unit by unit, we're organizing our reading into domains, correct? That's correct. And, and core knowledge has exactly what's called for at the top of page 33 of the standards, a coherent sequence of texts. So for example, you wouldn't just do Columbus because of October being Columbus Day, right. you would precede the study of Columbus with a study of geography so that children understand Europe and North America. Columbus was an explorer, as were a number of other explorers. So you would have some geography. You would study the kings in, mm. in, continental, in continental Europe or the concept of a king because without kings there would not have been much exploration. Mm -hmm. So then when you have the study of geography, the study of kings, the study of other explorers, and the study of Native Americans, then you have a coherent series of texts that build knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that, in fact, is the most effective way to grow knowledge. So if knowledge is one of the things that curricula has to change to address, core knowledge is a perfect example of that. But that in itself is not, is not everything, because it's also taught through read aloud. Mm -hmm. It's taught through what they call the listening and learning strand of core knowledge. And for 60 minutes a day, students are listening to complex text being read aloud. Now, it's very active. They do turn and talk. They do games. You break it up into intervals, mm -hmm. and you make it as active as possible. But nevertheless, they are listening. They are listening to a flow of words. And it's that flow of words that develops knowledge and develops academic vocabulary, exactly as is called for on the top of page 33 of the standards. Well, I'll say I'm not sure that we wouldn't have explored without kings, because I think the human mind is naturally curious, and exploration is part of that. And I think part of the potency of core knowledge is it allows children to be curious about the world and get that fed. Because I do think we're hardwired to want to know how things work and why things connect. And core knowledge is also science and the arts, and it is how the world works. I think that's one of the other things that is super appealing about it and that teachers start to love when they, when they actually are using the, the curriculum with their children. So, but is it developmentally appropriate to be feeding that curiosity and be feeding that thirst for knowledge with topics like the kings of Western Europe or topics like Native Americans or topics like Mesopotamia? Absolutely, I don't, you know, I, everybody, who can takes their children to museums, they don't not answer their questions about the Egyptians or not answer their questions about what the, the art on the wall is saying or what, why there are stars and stripes on an American flag when a, when a child would ask that of their, class, of their, of their parents huh? or, or caregivers. So core knowledge takes that and, and unifies it and offers it as a curriculum for every child, even the parents, even the children of parents who might not be able to take their kids to a museum or might not have that kind of access. So the fact that most four-year-olds can tell the difference between a Tyrannosaurus rex and a Brontosaurus is the curiosity that we're working with. And part of what core knowledge has done is organize a sequence of these sort of dives into different content areas. David, you're saying they build on each other. 
Yeah, the, the, the brontosaurus is a good example because the, the child who's crazy about brontosaurus and tyrannosaurus, etc., has in all likelihood read a series of books mm -hmm. within the topic of dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. So that when they get to whatever the fine points are mm -hmm. between Diplodocus and, and Tyrannosaurus, et cetera. Or triceratops. They, or triceratops, thank you very much. They <laughs> have that entire background knowledge right. that in their case came because they were fascinated with the topic and they got it through reading. And somebody gave them access. Yes. Mm -hmm. And fed that. Yes. And, and, and it started with their curiosity. Right. So my, my five-year-old has a real curiosity about bugs and is constantly reading anything she can get her hands on about bugs. She wants me to read texts to her that are way more complex than she herself can access, even if a bunch of the words in it are unfamiliar, because it's about this picture where this bug is eating this other bug. And I want to understand that, right? So the photo itself is drawing her in, and then there's complex text all around it that she's trying to track just out of her own curiosity. And, and by doing that, she's developing knowledge of the world right. and knowledge of words and of sentence structure, and of how ideas get packaged and housed when they're about complicated ideas. So even if she doesn't understand every last word, she's getting those exposures mm -hmm. that are setting her up to do really well when she can encounter those sentences and those words for herself. Right, and now she's got the, the two words predator and prey and can apply those to some other context, some other domain at a later time. Exactly, and I wanna go back, if it's okay, to developmentally appropriate. Yeah. There was an example in core knowledge that someone felt was very inappropriate, that they were teaching the children the word commission in the context that the king had commissioned Mozart mm -hmm. to, to create some music. But in fact, the reason what made it developmentally appropriate was that they'd learned about kings. They knew that kings do things like commission. They'd learned about music in that part of our history, mm -hmm. and they learned that kings very often Requ requested certain kind of music and paid for people to perform music. And then they learned that Mozart was a musician and a famous musician as part of this coherent sequence of knowledge. So the idea of a word such as commission mm -hmm. being developmentally inappropriate is not the case because they had the knowledge mm -hmm. to understand the meaning of the word. Mm -hmm. Let alone that a different queen later commissioned Columbus to be an explorer. So but part of what feels uncomfortable about that sequence is that you're therefore reading Columbus in the spring. And not on I'm Columbus Day. I'm used to day. reading Columbus on Columbus Day or around Columbus Day, right? So there's structural changes that need to happen in order to follow these sequences as well. Well, it would mean that we'd have to have a curriculum that we can know, we're, we're not gonna meet these standards, nor are we gonna address this achievement gap if the social studies curriculum K and two is holidays and festivals. That will not develop, that's not what the standards called for, a coherent sequence of knowledge. Plus, when you jump around from topic to topic, be it holidays and, and festivals or, or anything like it, you're privileging those students who come to school with greater background knowledge. About that concept. Because mm -hmm. if they jump around, they have a little bit of a sense. But the students who have much less background knowledge get lost in the wake when you jump from topic to topic. Core knowledge by spending a significant amount of time within each topic, be it kings, explorers, musicians, helps to somewhat level the playing field. Mm -hmm. And what is your experience in terms of teachers who start using this curriculum? Because I know you've worked with a lot of teachers who are getting smarter at this, at applying this. It's a, it's a shift for teachers in the beginning. They are not used to teaching first graders about Mesopotamia, Egypt, or the explorers. But then th when they do it, when they start wading into it, and it's all there for them for, to read out loud, and they, they do learn about it on their own, they're consistently stunned. By, and they'll say things like, you know, I, I, it just seemed like I thought it was gonna be over their heads, but the next day, they came in with all these questions. And one boy bought a little doll of a mummy that he found somewhere. And so th they're totally into it. And I've seen some great skits that they've done about the War of 1812. There's a conception that because something is intellectually meaningful, that it can't be taught to young children. That's entirely wrong. There's no evidence in the world for that. Any intellectual content that's, cre that's presented in a coherent, sequential way can be taught to young children. So this, but this change feels new. This change feels uncomfortable. And a lot of this can feel scripted. So is there a way for teachers to live with this curriculum to, to sort of 
uh, make their classroom their keep their classroom their own and adopt this cu curriculum and still feel like they have a sense of ownership and they're making their own decisions about their own students. I I think that all these shifts are a lot for for teachers that in states that have adopted the Common Core. So I think that the supports that are there in Core Knowledge, the set of the set of educational points for the teacher and the set of guidance, are there if a teacher needs them and for as long as a teacher needs them. There's really a parallel to the kinds of scaffoldings we're gonna talk about that With students kids. need yep. when complex text happens and they're not used to it. So when you're unaccustomed to something, there has to be a way to map what is known to the new. I would say as if teachers who don't need the script, teachers who don't like the script shouldn't use it, and anybody should be free to embellish so that you get things like dramatic reenactments and kids riffing on stuff and making it their own. But that is what should happen. I'm sure that's, I think that's what the authors are dying to have happen. They don't want it to be this scripted thing. It's there as support if support is desired. What I would add to that is, it's nice to start with what nobody in education disagrees with because there's not many things. Some students need more time and attention to learn the spelling sound patterns of the English language. The problem is no one knows how much more some students need. And some students need a great deal more. And so any program or any curriculum that teaches foundational skills in K-2 to needs to be sure that there's abundant materials that are easily accessed and easily implemented for those students who need a great deal more time and attention to master spelling sound patterns. The brilliance of CKLA on Engage New York is that they have that. But that guide is really something that a teacher can access and use and download for free, I should say, whether they're using core knowledge or not. In, in general, the, the CKLA materials are really respectful of teacher time and teacher knowledge. Mm -hmm. And um, they, they, what I love about them is they, they teach why. They teach why these things are important. So even if our teachers aren't coming in prepared with that rock solid knowledge, they, if they choose to, they can be educated through the materials. So they stop at the pausing points, which I believe are every six weeks, but I could be wrong about that. But then they assess, they see what students have mastered, what spelling sound patterns and what sight words, and they have this abundance of materials for those students who haven't and for those students who, who have. So it's, it's thorough, systematic, and efficient in that way. Going back to the reading wars in education, there's been a debate or, or different fields about decodable texts. Should you teach students with texts that are decodable? such as the rat sat on the hat? Or should you t teach students with texts that are predictable? Part of the problem with decodables is people look at decodables and they say, well, the rat sat on the hat, that's not really great literature. I don't want my students to be exposed to reading with text that's so contrived in that, in that way. What, what Cornelich has done is they have made a decodable series, but it is really interesting, really kid-friendly, almost all narrative. And I've seen it used now in scores of schools. And as soon as the kids get it, the biggest problem they have with the core knowledge sequence of readers is that the kids, when they finish, they want to go ahead before they're supposed to go ahead to the next series because they want to see what happens. They're not only interesting, they not only have interesting characters, but they bring in knowledge around the world. So material designed to learn to read is also teaching them while they read. So that dichotomy isn't present. For kindergarten, first grade, we have absolute research to show that learning the spelling sound pattern systematically is a better way to learn beginning, beginning reading.